joined in the last few minutes. Um, we'll kind of start from the top. So I'm I'm the communications and outreach associate, um, and welcome to our virtual holiday party of 2020. Um, you know, usually every year we get together in person at the office, and we have food and drinks, and we just love to see you all and really celebrate all your support. And whether that's being a member or being a volunteer or being a partner, um, we always look forward to that. So um, unfortunately, we can't do that this year, but we have the magic of Zoom. So we're going to try our best and um, we hope you all enjoy tonight. So um, how it's going to go is um, you're going to hear from Jay Keeney over in OMAC. Um, so um, his, his internet can be a little spotty at times. So in case he drops off suddenly, just bear with us. He'll pop back in a moment. Um, and he's got some really exciting news to share about one of our biggest accomplishments of 2020. Um, and then we'll show a very quick video. And then uh, Chase Scannell, our communications director, is going to go over some other accomplishments we uh, managed to achieve during this unprecedented year. Um, as well as take some questions from attendees about our work or about um, what our hopes and goals are for next year, that sort of thing. Um, so feel free to um, submit some questions in the, the chat or using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And then we'll hear a quick toast from Mitch. And then um, Heather, our um, special events um, coordinator. <laughs> Sorry, she has a long, long job title. Um, she is going to do a raffle. So um, all of you have been entered into a raffle to, to win some really, really cool Conservation Northwest swag. So stay tuned for that. And then um, we're going to transition over to a virtual socializing platform, which Heather will walk us through. And we will give some thorough directions on how to do that. So. Without further ado, um, I'll go ahead and hand it over to Jay. Okay, uh, that was a handoff to me. I, I just barely heard it. So um, I'm Jay Keeney. I live in OMAC. I work for Conservation Northwest about 12 years now, and um, I'm lead on the Sage Islands Heritage Program. And I'm going to try to, in seven minutes, encapsulate you know my feelings and about one of the projects I've been able to work on. Uh, proudly work on. That's taken almost that entire time. I think we started on this 10 years ago. And that's the neatest part about this, this project that we've completed um, to date. In August of this year, we were able to improve Janus Bridge as an underpass, have a mile of fence completed to funnel wildlife under the road and um, stop causing accidents and, and being killed on the Highway 97. Um, that was just a dream 10 years ago. Science pointed us to this area and said, this is where there's an hourglass. You know, the hourglass is the skinny part right above OMAC, about 10 miles where this Janus Bridge is. And on either side is the Cascades Mountains and the Olympic, uh, or excuse me, the uh, Rocky Mountains. And this hourglass is where so much wildlife is funneling through. I mean, it was a no brainer that there was a lot of uh, wildlife getting killed on this highway. So that was one of our projects was to figure out a way to, uh, to stop that. And underpasses are the, are the main way we can do that. So the fact that this is completed now, this mile was done with a lot of tenacity of staff, a lot of support of our board and directors. It was um, unbelievable the contributions that came from all over the state, from a variety of collaborators. It was wide and broad with Mule Deer Foundation and Colville Confederated Tribes and Backcountry Hunters and Anglers and um, the Department of Wildlife. And then all the individuals like people that are on tonight that gave to, to make this happen. It's just fantastic. And before I go any farther, I'm gonna to toast you all because that to me was just fabulous. Oh, my wine glass disappeared on the screen. <laughs> um, that we had that support for so long because it took a while. And I will say that that tenacity to get this done is part of the Conservation Northwest, I think, stamp that we, if we know it's the right thing to do, we stick with it and we get it done. And along the way, some funny things happen. We made beautiful and wonderful relationships with a lot of partners, but a lot of people that we weren't expecting to be partners with. We started to form kind of a, of a, a cause for something that everybody believed in, but it didn't matter if you were a red or a blue, 
person, if you're from east side or west side, if you were on whatever side of the political spectrum you were on, and we said we need to stop vehicle accidents with deer on this highway, everybody agreed. And with that, we could form these great partnerships. And I made some wonderful friends that I never thought um, would have occurred when we first started. So um, with that, I think the, the future is still bright and it's gonna take the tenacity and the audacity to say, we're gonna go now go for 18 more million dollars to finish the next 11 miles and try to get that accomplished in our legislature this year. If we're successful, that means we'd have the money to finish the project because we've only really gotten one mile done with this private money that came in from donors and foundations and a lot of different organizations that supported us. So as we move into the future, it's gonna take a lot of work again, but what a, what a wonderful way to say, we got it done. And I can't help but think everywhere you drive around the state, you can see examples of how Conservation Northwest gets things done. Whether you're on I-90 and you go under that beautiful overpass and you think back to how that happened, um, whether you're in the Colville National Forest and you think about uh, Northeastern Washington uh, Forestry Coalition and the work they've done for so many years and have reformed and tooled up and tried to keep that drive alive to eventually have a, a wilderness um, in the kettles. So everywhere we go, there's examples of that. And right now, as people drive Highway 97, everyone that comes to Janus Bridge on that highway and that mile of fencing knows who did it. They know Conservation Northwest was involved. They know we had a great group of partners, you know, like I mentioned, Mule Deer Foundation was at the lead a lot of times, but everyone knows we were a part of that. We helped make it happen. In fact, we were, we were the actual driving force behind it. And everyone's proud of it. They get to see it on the landscape and go, oh, that's not an ugly fence. That's a very good looking fence. Oh, I haven't hit a deer here in the last week. I wonder why that is. And so it's very, very effective at showing what we're doing and for the rest of the stretch. So with that, I don't know if I've gone over seven minutes. I have no idea, but I'll toast again to all the people that um, donated to this, supported it, all the great partners, all the individuals and organizations. Um, thank you for you know being there and supporting us as we got this first phase done with the private funds and donations you gave. Cheers. Thanks so much, Jay. Um, so to show you all an example of how much this effort and this wildlife crossing is actually working and the real impact of it, we have a fun little video um, showing all sorts of animals going under the Janus Bridge under crossing. So I'm going to share my screen and play that video for you all right now. I believe the video she's showing is uh, there's cameras and they're recording thousands of pictures of wildlife using this underpass every month, thousands of photos.
All right, I love that video, it's so fun. Um, so now we're gonna go ahead and roll into some of our other accomplishments from this year, um, and then um, an opportunity for Q&A. So I will give it to Chase. Yeah, thanks again for joining us, everyone. I'm gonna open up a PowerPoint here that we'll move through fairly quickly. And I wanna save some space for any questions that you all have about our work this year or projects that are on the radar for 2021. So let me bring that up right now and feel free to put your questions or your thoughts and feedback in the chat. And I'll, I'll do my best to monitor that as they come in. All right, team, are you seeing the PowerPoint? Yep, Great. We can see. So this was a busy year. Um, despite all that was going on in the world, we at Conservation Northwest forged ahead as best we could. And I think given our role working collaboratively on local projects at the state, local and regional level, we were able to get a lot done despite the pandemic and and the crazy year that 2020 was. So we're, we're proud of our work this year. We're looking forward to more big projects in 2021 and we're rolling with the punches as best we can. Some of the things that were most noticeable this year or most notable um, at the top of the list, we have to start with fishers. I mean, after nearly 20 years of working to bring these members of the weasel family back to Washington state, we met our overall project goal we had more than 250 fishers released over that time from the Olympics to the South Cascades around Mount Rainier to the North Cascades around Mount uh, North Cascades National Park and Mount Baker Soquami National Forest. Um, it was a long time coming from Mitch and from when Mitch and Dave Wertz worked with the Department of Transportation to prepare a feasibility study all the way back in 2002 to the start of fisher releases on the Olympic Peninsula in 2012, and then in 2015 in the South Cascades, and then two years of releases on in the North Cascades, and we finally met that project goal early in 2020 in February. So now it's, it's really exciting to know that those fishers are out there across some of the wildest areas of our state. They're even reproducing and having babies, as we've seen on some remote camera photos. And it's our job now to, to monitor them with our state and federal and National Park Service partners and see what we can do to continue to shepherd this recovery along. But those animals are now back out on the landscape and we are just thrilled that this project has been successful after such a long timeline. Another thing that we were a part of that really ties into so many different areas of Conservation Northwest work was the Great American Outdoors Act, which included full and permanent funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. You've probably heard a lot about this milestone from other conservation groups, from the media, outdoor recreationists. This was really a big tent effort that our entire community worked together to pass. And it wouldn't have happened without all of the the organizations that were pushing all across the country. I know both Mitch and I traveled to Washington DC at different times to help lobby for this bill um, to secure such a broad conservation package that was capstoned by permanent and full funding for the Land and Water Conservation Fund. It was a huge thing, but our work doesn't stop here. We have other priorities in the other Washington from the Recovering America's Wildlife Act to green infrastructure that helps support more wildlife crossings like this construction you see here on Interstate 90. And we're gonna keep our nose to the grindstone to continue doing what we can to support projects and our bills and projects like this, along with partners like the National Wildlife Federation. Congress isn't an easy place to work these days, but the Great American Outdoors Act show that we can still get things done when we work together. We filed a lawsuit earlier in the year that is something we have been working on as long as Conservation Northwest has been around, which is fighting to 
update the interpretation of our state constitution for our state forests so that they benefit all the people of Washington, as well as the fish and wildlife and clean waters that flow from our public forests, not just specific trusts and counties. Uh, this is a complex topic. There's a lot of legalese to dig through when it comes to the mandate for our state forest managed by the Department of Natural Resources. If you're interested, I encourage you to check out some of the resources on our website. Uh, there's a great blog from Mitch there laying out the details of this case and why it's got such big implications. But for us, this is a, a major fight that we're going to be pursuing in the year ahead. And we think that it has serious implications for bringing the management of state forests into the 21st century and really embracing all of the values that our forests have for local communities and schools, but also for clean water, for carbon sequestration, for fish and wildlife, for recreation, and really all the people of Washington state. So this is one to pay close attention to and we're excited that it's moving forward. I'm just gonna let this roll really quick. This is a fisher, one of those fishers that we or our partners released going under I-90 wildlife crossings. Uh, this is the crossing right there near Hayak, just east of Snoqualmie Pass. And if that isn't um, the nexus of multiple conservation programs led by Conservation Northwest, I don't know what is. You, here you have a, a species that's been restored to the landscape through a collaboration with the Department of Fish and Wildlife, the Forest Service and the National Park Service, traveling under a wildlife crossing that we championed for years in partnership with the Washington Department of Transportation, Okanagan Wenatchee National Forest and other partners. And it's just so exciting to see these two projects collide like this. We've got more videos like this one um, up on our YouTube channel. And I did see a question about getting some new, new photos and videos of animals using the crossings during the daylight. And, and unfortunately, you know, critters are more likely to be traveling in the morning and evening and nighttime hours. But we do have some of those videos up on YouTube and I know the Department of Transportation does as well. We've been working through our Cascades to Olympics program, which really got up and running in the last two years to help protect habitat, restore habitat, and then provide for connections between Western Washington's two largest wild areas, the, the Cascade Mountains and then the Olympic Peninsula, as well as the Willapa Hills to the south. One of the elements of that work is Brian Stewart, our local coordinator based in Lewis County, has been working with partners on the Chehalis River Alliance to inform a process for flood control and aquatic species restoration in the Chehalis Basin towards sustainable outcomes. And when we say that, we mean forest and floodplain restoration, community preparedness, not a billion dollar dam on Washington's, Western Washington's best salmon river as has been proposed by some, um, some members of a county board. One of the big wins in pushing back on that dam proposal has been a letter, letter from Governor Inslee this summer calling for alternatives to the dam for flood control in the Chehalis Basin. That didn't come out of thin air. We had more than 750 people take action on action alerts that we shared. We saw a number of letters from our partners at the Quinault Nation and Chehalis Tribe and a whole lot of work from Brian and our policy director, Paula Swedeen in Olympia to work with local residents to hear their concerns, but to make clear that a new dam on the Chehalis River is not the answer. And in fact, there are other alternatives for flood control that also support wildlife habitat and connectivity in Southwest Washington. Uh, we're really proud of the work that we've done there. We're really honored to work with partners like the Quinault Nation and Chehalis Tribes and some of the other local groups. And there's a lot more work to be done there in the Chehalis Basin through our Cascades to Olympics program. We've been continuing to fight for wolverine protections. You know, this is one of the rarest species in the lower 48 and an animal that Conservation Northwest has been working on for decades, both through our citizen wildlife monitoring program and, and many of you are involved with that out there seeking to document wolverines in the high elevation areas of the Cascades, but also through the courts. The US Fish and Wildlife Service, particularly under the Trump administration has continually failed to protect wolverines under the Endangered Species Act, despite court rulings encouraging them to do so. We're going to bat for these animals to ensure they get the ESA 
protections they need, and we're not going to give up until that's, that happens. We've continued our, our collaboration in Northeast Washington, including through the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition. This is vital work with some of our partners from our staffer, Tiana Luke, and many of our colleagues in Northeast Washington on the Colville National Forest. And while we're seeing some really productive conversations happening around support for wilderness, around restoration projects, there's also some concerns about the direction that some of the projects in the forest are going. And that included us filing in partnership with the Forest Coalition, filing an objection to the Sandpoil project in Northeast Washington. Um, this can be a, a little bit of wonky work in terms of the detail of forest restoration and, and how that work gets done, but it's really important for the community there and for our staff and our partners on the ground and is a great example of what makes Conservation Northwest unique, getting out there on the landscape, working with our neighbors and finding ways to move forward for the benefit of our communities and for the forest and the critters that live there. A lot happening up in Northeast Washington and we hope to have some more big projects to share in early 2021 on the Colville National Forest. Jay Shepard and our Range Rider pilot project team were, were particularly busy this past summer. Jay also, administers the Northeast Washington Wolf Cattle Collaborative, a local grassroots group. And between that effort and the range rider pilot project that Conservation Northwest runs, we had more than 15 range riders out in wolf country in Northeast Washington this year. Through Paula Swedeen's work in Olympia, we also saw more funding go to range riders and other conflict avoidance methods through the Northeast Washington Wolf Cattle Collaborative and through the Department of Fish and Wildlife. And while we know that we're never gonna prevent conflict between wolves and livestock entirely, this work is a big step forward in terms of keeping that conflict to a minimum and making sure that the standards for range riding and other conflict avoidance are thorough and effective and that when, when those standards are not met, there are, there are ways to hold all parties accountable. So it's, it's you know, a part of our long process towards wolf recovery and coexistence. And this year we saw a lot, of, a lot of work on the ground to keep conflict to a minimum and to, to make coexistence happen. We continued collaboration on forest restoration, projects like the Snoquera just west of Crystal Mountain and the Little Crow Project in the Natchez watershed on the east side of the Central Cascades. Our staffer Laurel Baum has led our Central Cascades watersheds restoration program and has done a bunch of very good work in that landscape to guide forest and watershed restoration work, to partner with recreationists, to put up new signage, to help support responsible off-road vehicle use. Laurel has just been a rock star when it comes to advising and improving projects and work on the ground in the Central Cascades. And we're really proud of the accomplishments in the last year, particularly that Snoquera and Little Crow projects, which are great models for collaborative watershed and forest restoration, both in the Central Cascades and around the region. And on a similar note, we worked with the Forest Service and partners like the Wilderness Society, Trout Unlimited, and the Meta Valley Citizens Council to support the Metau rest or the Mission Restoration Project in the Metau Valley, another landscape scale restoration project on the National Forest that covers 50,000 acres and provides a model for how we can restore the health of our forests, support local communities, and support fish and wildlife on those forests at a landscape scale. More information about all those projects is available on our website. Through our Healthy Watersheds campaign, we've been working with partners in Alaska, Montana, British Columbia, and the rest of the Pacific Northwest transboundary region to push back against mining threats from mines over the border in British Columbia, where industrial mining is underregulated and puts waters like the Skagit, Milkamine, and Upper Columbia at risk. More than a thousand people took action this year through our action alerts, and we've got more work and big plans ahead for the coming year, including the legislative session. So please stay tuned and look out for action alerts to help contact your legislators, calling on them to take action and send a message to Victoria that British Columbia needs to get its mining regulation in order to protect some of our wildest watersheds. 
We worked with the Forest Service to inform a massive clear cut that found its way into the Nooksock restoration project. It's another example of where we hold the Forest Service accountable when we need to. Um, the Nooksack project started out as a, a promising collaborative restoration proposal, and then all of a sudden there was a huge clear cut in the mix. We pushed back and we're in the process of guiding that proposal, that project, back in the direction of more collaborative, science-oriented restoration that supports the health of the watershed, watershed the forest, and the people that, that love that landscape near Mount Baker. Um, it's a great example of the value of our forest field program from the Metau to the Central Cascades to the North Cascades and beyond. And thank you to many of you, more than 1,400 people took action to help push back on that project and encourage the Forest Service to return to a more restoration-oriented plan. Our team up in the Okanagan, including Jay Keeney and Mike Liu, our forest field lead in the Okanagan, have been working with the Tenasket, the Tenasket Ranger District to decommission old and obsolete forest roads. This work is supported by the Working for Wildlife Initiative, which we coordinate in the Okanagan Valley through funding from the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. And it's exciting to see as, as that project has been in the works for years, all that's been done under the banner of the Working for Wildlife Initiative. And this road decommissioning is just the latest project that that, that collaborative group has been able to achieve. Um, we've got a lot more information on our website about other elements of that collaborative and all the different public and private partners involved. And I look forward to sharing more about that as, it, as the Working for Wildlife Initiative wraps up in 2021. Our Sagelands Heritage Program has been busy from pulling out fences to working with landowners in central Washington to preserve their properties and the shrub step habitat on private and working lands. But we're also working with the State Department of Fish and Wildlife for shrub step species like sage grouse and pronghorn antelope. And one of the examples of that is this fall, the Department of Fish and Wildlife in response to damage from really catastrophic wildfires in the sage lands that happened over Memorial Day weekend. They have proposed to uplist sage grouse in Washington from threatened to a state endangered species. We've got fewer than a thousand of these birds in the state and that was before the fires. After those big fires in Douglas and Okanagan County around Memorial Day weekend, we might be looking at losing as much as 50% of the sage grouse in Washington from what was already a small and fragmented population. So it's really important that these, these rare birds get all the protections they need from the state. And this uplisting proposal is one way to support that. We've already had more than 600 people take action. The deadline has got a few weeks left. So if you haven't yet, please go on our website um, if you scroll down to the bottom of the homepage, you can find the link to take action for sage grouse. We've got a few weeks left and we really want to see that the, the birds in central Washington that have been impacted by fires and habitat fragmentation get these protections from the state to help support recovery efforts. We've also been doing our best to fight for another sage step species, bighorn sheep, which have been impacted by fresh outbreaks of a respiratory disease, and no, it's not coronavirus. They have been experiencing outbreaks of pneumonia from a fatal bacteria that is transmitted from domestic sheep to wild bighorn sheep. We've seen one herd put at risk from a wandering domestic ewe. We saw another herd that's had this disease for several years in the Yakima Canyon. And then just this fall, the Clement Mountain bighorn herd, it was announced had contracted um, the, the pneumonia that comes from a bacteria that I won't even try to pronounce, but we have it listed on our website. This is concerning given the pattern of bighorn disease in central Washington. Previously, this area on the east side of the Cascades around Yakima and Ellensburg was the stronghorn for bighorn sheep in our state. And here we have at least two and maybe three herds in the area that are infected with a fatal disease. We're calling for action from the Forest Service and the State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And we really wanna see follow up on this issue from them in 2021. So thank you to everyone that's that's joined us in calling for changes in how bighorn sheep are managed on public lands in central Washington. And just a few weeks ago, as I think I mentioned, our Sagelands Heritage Program, along with local volunteers in the Ellensburg area and partners at the Department of Fish and Wildlife and 
Pheasants Forever, Mule Deer Foundation, and other local organizations removed another 7.5 miles of derelict fencing from wildlife areas near Ellensburg. Earlier this year, we had, thanks to support from the Lee Foundation, our Sage Zones Heritage Program team had removed another three and a half miles of fencing in the same area for a total of 11 miles of old barbed wire fencing that is no longer on the landscape, better allowing for species like mule deer and elk, and even those sage grouse, which sometimes fly headlong into this fencing, um, better allowing for them to move across the landscape and persist in central Washington's shrub step sage lands. Uh, we're really excited about this work and just actually today put out a new blog about some of that fence removal. Finally, just, just last week, we entered into a lawsuit against the Forest Service on the Colville with concerns around expanded ATV use that happened without any proper public or environmental review. Um, hoping to see some action on this from the Forest Service in the year ahead, whether that comes through the courts or preferably through fresh collaboration through groups like the Northeast Washington Forest Coalition. So that was a quick run through of some of our highlights from 2020. I'm going to pull the, um, the chat box back up and I would be happy to answer any questions or invite my Conservation Northwest colleagues to chime in around topics that they're working on either in the chat or live here among our panel. And I, I see that one of the questions and maybe Mitch would be, Mitch and Jay would be great for helping weigh in on this. One of the questions is the how, what are our plans for purchase and partnerships around private lands conservation in the year ahead? You know, the Sage Lands Heritage Program and other efforts, we recognize that conservation doesn't just happen on public lands. Private lands are also a huge part of the picture when it comes to protecting and connecting habitat here in Washington State, whether it's between the Cascades and the Rockies, in Southwest Washington from the Cascades to the Olympics. Uh, Mitch and Jay, anything that you want to share around work with private landowners that we have in mind for the year ahead? I'll say that we play a unique role in that area. There's a lot of energy that goes into private land conservation. The Nature Conservancy comes to mind and, and land trusts in you know, almost every county of the West. Our role is to stay focused on keeping the overall landscape functional. We add our greatest value when we're protecting habitat corridors that keep the landscape intact. And those habitat corridors generally cross in places, private lands. And in those places, we intensely focus with qualified partners like local land trusts or statewide or national groups. We seldom at Conservation Northwest hold title to easements or fee simple deeds, but in some cases we'll do even that. Remember a couple of years ago, we raised uh, $1.2 million and bought the Chapman Ranch in Okanagan County, part of the Cascades to Rockies Habitat Corridor. We slapped an easement on it and we resold it to a conservation buyer. So when I get to my toast in a little bit, I'll do a little bit more, but the short answer is yeah, hell yeah. Thank you for that. Paula Swedeen, our policy director down in Olympia, brings up a great point in the chat, which is that we're going to be working with the legislature this winter to get carbon funding for private land conservation and forests, floodplains, and rangelands. This is a great win-win opportunity to both begin to chip away at climate change and also to preserve habitat and healthy wild lands for people and animals. We have some other legislative priorities for the year ahead, including fully funding the rest of the Safe Passage 97 project, as Jay mentioned, and also securing strong messages from the Washington state government, the governor and the legislature to British Columbia over those transboundary mining concerns that I mentioned earlier. So stay tuned, we've got some big objectives for Olympia this January and February, and I'm sure you'll hear more about them from Mitch and Paula. I'd, I'd mentioned too, <clears throat> Chase, <clears throat> the Yakima Basin Integrated Plan. Uh, we've had an opportunity to provide input to their selection criteria for 
shrub step habitat that needs to be purchased as mitigation. So that's really positive and they have several thousand acres that they need to be looking at. So we're working on that. Um, also just some of the landowner contacts and, and relationship building up in uh, key areas for sharp tail grouse in Douglas County. We've been building those and hope to some at some point identify some of those properties that could be open for either conversion back to native uh, plants um, um, with some of those private landowners. Thank you, Jay. Well, I'm gonna turn it over to Mitch now for his toast. If you have more questions, that presentation that I ran through and, and all those topics that I listed, you know, that was a really quick overview of our highlights from the past year. If you have more questions, please feel free to go on our website, feel free to follow up with us as staff be happy to discuss any of those issues or give you a bit more detail if you'd like it. And with that, Mitch, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Chase. And thanks, Jay and, and Keiko, great job. Uh, you know, watching that presentation, I, uh, you know, we're so lucky. We live in such a beautiful place to see those landscapes and those creatures and you know, there's such a, a need, the challenges are pressing and, and our progress is inspiring. It's such a privilege to do what we do. I'm so privileged to work with the people I get to work with, this team across the state, our staff. We also have several board members, Joseph Joy, our new board president, Elise Lovkin, our outgoing board president, Alex Lowe, Bill Donnelly, maybe other board members are with us here for, for this celebration. Um, you know, 31 years, that's how long we've been plugging and that's how long I've been plugging. And to see, to be reminded in Chase's presentation of some of these things like, you know, Fisher reintroduction that took almost 20 years to get done. <clears throat> um, you know, we're still fighting to protect old growth, it's something you know, I've been working on for over 35 years. We don't give up here. And next year is going to be a rocking year. You know, if, if you thought this year was tough and the way people feel that 2020 was a cursed year, I hope you got a sense from that presentation that for us, it was not cursed. We were not in our bunkers. We were not quarantined. Conservation Northwest never missed a step. Our people, you know, Jay works out of his freaking living room in OMAC. Tiana, who's on the call from Deer Park or Paula, they, folks are working out of their homes close to the ground. Mike Liu is with us tonight too, working out of his home. Sometimes, usually he's out hiking if his Facebook has any indication. Uh, and we're not held back by the circumstances of this year. And we got a ton done and I'm so proud of it, but next year's gonna be better. There's gonna be more wildlife bridges to talk about in the years ahead. The transportation budget that the legislature will cook up in the next few months. We're gonna make sure there's good stuff in there. Uh, not just Highway 97 either. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to say too much, but Paul and I are working together to evaluate the feasibility of raising a bunch more money to buy a stellar and ecologically crucial private ranch to finish work that, you know, has been in our sights for well over 10 years. You'll also, in the months ahead, hear about kind of a recurring theme. There's a part of the state that doesn't have near as much wilderness protected as it deserves to. And the election outcomes, you know, there were some surprises that you don't hear a lot about that opened some opportunities that we're attuned to and cultivating. And um, I just can't wait for 2021. We're going to well, one more thing, grizzly bears, all these years, so close to have it snatched away from us, but we're gonna get that process back on track. And uh, tomorrow we're briefing 
Senator Murray's staff about that. And, uh, you know, every year we're going to just keep celebrating because we're going to keep working and we're going to keep making progress. We couldn't do it without you. And it's so great to have such a great family committed to such an important, and beautiful region. Thank you. Happy holidays. And here's to 2021. Thank you, Mitch, for that great toast. It was indeed a great year and we're looking forward for 2021. Um, we wanna thank you all for joining us tonight. And um, to thank you, we, have, we actually have a holiday raffle and have randomly selected two of you to win a special prize of Conser Conservation Northwest gear. Um, so if your name is selected, please keep an eye out on your email and we'll uh, be in touch with you to coordinate getting you that prize. So our winners tonight are Daniel Keimer and Kathleen Linscott. And I see you both on. So um, yeah, we'll be in touch with you to follow up on that. And we'll actually have one more um, prize available and that will be um, in our wildlife world, which is coming up next. Um, so, I'll go into that in just a moment, but to win that prize, you'll have to find me, Heather, in Wildlife World and answer my trivia question, which um, is a surprise. And the first person to answer that question correctly will win um, the final prize of the evening. So just so you know, um, Wildlife World is, um, as Keiko had mentioned at the beginning, a virtual social gathering place. And it's pretty, pretty self-explanatory once you get in there, but all you have to do is join via a link that I'll share in just a moment and in the chat. And all you have to do is enter your name and select your the little avatar character that you want. Um, you have to make sure to use on a computer, either Firefox or Chrome browsers, and um, then just click join the gathering. And then once you're in there, you can move around with the arrows on your keyboard um, and you can video chat with each other and be sure to, um, uh, you can hit your a little microphone or uh, to turn off your, your microphone if you're listening to a video or other, other interactive objects that are in there. And um, yeah, we look forward to exploring that with you. If you have any issues when you're in there, there's little Zikan people walking around um, and you'll see Zika and support and you can ask them questions or you can send me an email and that my email is in the chat if you have issues and then the link also is in the chat right now. So um, yeah, we'll hope to see you all in there. And again, find me for that last trivia question. And thank you all for joining us tonight. All right, thanks everyone so much. That wraps up the Zoom portion of tonight's event. Um, we hope to see you in Wildlife World. Feel free to stay how, uh, how little or as long as you want. It's completely optional. So thanks everyone for coming and we hope you enjoy your holidays. Jay, since you are still on, I had one question from Jenna Gilman about wildfires in the shrub step, and I'm gonna I'm gonna send it to you via email in case you'd like to follow up with her. Um, but for anyone who's still on, you know, this is a this is a topic that we've done a lot of work on, that Jay's done a lot of work on. Wildfires are a, a hot topic in Washington and across the West, and they're not the same as far as the complexity of these fires and the issues around them in dry forests like those in the Cascades and in the shrub steppe in, in places like Jay's background. There's a lot of distinction between the two and the different factors at play. Um, so Jay, I just wanna give you a heads up that Jenna Gilman had a good question about wildfires and I'm gonna send you her contact. We can follow up on that. And if anyone else wants to learn more, I'll put a link in the chat. Sounds good, Chase, thank you. All right, thank you all, and I'll see many of you over in Wildlife World. <laughs> wildlife World.
All right, Jay, have a good night.